Good morning and welcome to Carolina Cares, an iHeart Media production. My name is Tyler Ryan, your host, uh, and today we're going to talk about a very cool organization. Uh, I, I'm, I'm certain you have at least heard of this group. Uh, if you know anything about President Jimmy Carter, very, very, uh, very much in the middle of Habitat for Humanity, founded in 1976, some 40-odd years ago. My math is a bit fuzzy, but uh, over in Atlanta, Georgia. Nowadays, uh, Habitat for Humanity has a presence in all 50 states, 70-plus countries across the world. It's safe to say that that this uh, the project, this idea started uh, just by one house, two houses back in 1976 has really taken on. And, and here in the capital city, and in fact, the entire state of South Carolina, we have a very big presence for Habitat. And at least in the Midlands of South Carolina, led by, by uh, Roy Kramer, the executive director. First of all, good morning to you, sir. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I know you're busy yes. building houses and hammers and nails and whatnot. Oh, yeah. Always, always. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about, about the background, first of all. Like I said, I think mean, everybody knows at least what the concept of Habitat for Humanity is, unless you've lived under a rock. Right. Um, but but let's talk about maybe the forming, the background, back in 76. Sure. Back in 76, they started in Americus, Georgia. And that's actually six miles from Plains, Georgia. That's where they... Millard Fuller met uh, Jimmy Carter because he was from Plains, Georgia. And that's right. where that relationship started. You know, he wasn't the president quite then, right? He, he, uh, he was elected he, in 76. He, he but came in in 76, okay. yeah. I think he got involved right after he stepped out of the presidency. Temple, okay. Yeah. So the idea was to eliminate poverty housing. Um, and they started in America's Georgia. They went through some rough times. Um, you know, there's a lot of civil rights stuff going on. They had people knocking down stuff they were building and, and it slowly caught right. on. Um, well, and, 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 and I think that's an important to, to kind of wrap, wrap your brain around. If you were live back then in the South, you know what yeah, we're always yeah. talking about. If not, uh, you may not understand, but those were some very tumultuous times uh, in the South and in Alabama, South Carolina, Georgia. Civil rights, you know, we've already lost Martin Luther King Jr. back in the 60s and that still, minorities were still struggling to to get their voice to you know, to really take mm-hmm. foothold. And so, you know, you, you do have a lot of that, that oh, strife yeah. going on. Oh, yeah. They have, uh, Conania Farms is right there in uh, America's Georgia. That's really where it started with Clarence Jordan and Millard Fuller. And you can go down there and they have a museum and you can see where they were burned out a couple times mm-hmm. here and different things would happen to a potential homeowner. They, they would be in fear of their life. But sure. they kept with it and the good Lord was with us. And so it goes on. There you go. A little closer. There you go. Perfect. Perfect. So, uh, so it starts off just from those very humble beginnings. Yes. Really, where does where does it really start getting a foothold? You're dealing with you're dealing with the civil rights. You're dealing with right. with this issue. Right. As an aside, kind of walk us through. You know, maybe uh, the next ten. You know, when you, you get you get former President Jimmy Carter involved, right. that's got to put a little a shot in the old arm, right? That's correct. Uh, I think it was Millard Fuller basically who just took took it and and ran with it. And it was a simple concept, get a bunch of people together and let's build a house for somebody, raise the money and let's go. Sure. Uh, what makes it affordable is that there's no interest fee in charged on these houses. So when the people get their house, it's not given to them. They have to pay for it. So they pay back that particular habitat location. They can use that money to build another house or to start paying salaries, whatever it takes. So it's just a snowball effect and it keeps going. Sure. If Millard Fuller were alive today and you asked him how much does it take to start a house, he said $2, just get started. And right. the good Lord will provide, and that's how it's always worked. Now, and see, that's that's interesting. I'm glad you mentioned that too, because I I guess I didn't realize that they weren't free houses. When I think of Habitat, it's you're gifting. You know, we all right. see those those flipping shows now that yep. you know you give away a house and that kind of stuff. And it, no, maybe yeah. that concept's there, but that's not actually um, not Habitat all. for Humanity. Not at all. Our folks, um, when I came on board in '94, they had to get uh, I think it was 300 hours in um, during the time they were going through the program. Um, they could get it with family members. So, you know, they could they could get their hours in several months. Now we've we've expanded on that. It takes them two years to get through our program. Okay. They still now they have to get three hundred and fifty hours. If they're married, it's five hundred and fifty hours. But they also <clears throat> have to go to um, financial training. There's all kinds of classes that they take. I think it's a total of thirteen classes. It could be more now. Everything from nutrition to gang violence, and we have guest speakers come in and work with them. So they're measured on their hours that they work on the build site and the classes they go through. Um, there's basically three criteria. They have to be willingness to partner, ability to pay, and I always forget the third one. I'll catch it in a minute. But <laughs> we we do a financial background check on them. We make a home visit. Uh, so all these things are combined to whether they make it into the program or not. If right. they do make it into the program, uh, they go to financial counseling first, and they look at their debt to income ratio, and they bring they got to bring down their debt before they can get started. What usually happens is. Um, 
they have something that's very expensive, like one lady had bought a car and she hadn't missed a payment in a year. But when the financial advisor looked at it, he noticed she was paying 29% interest on the car. <sighs> Holy that, smokes. That's absurd. So they refinance it there at the bank. That brings the debt down. Then they can begin to start saving. They have to open up a savings account at the bank and put $75 a month in mm-hmm. for until they get to $1,600. You can't dump it all in. It's a monthly thing. So we measure how they do with that. So when our families are ready for a house, we've we've measured their attendance, their their um, management of their funding. Mm-hmm. So we know who's the good, you know, who's going to be a good selection. Years back, you just came in with your down payment, and that was the end of it. That's there right. was no way to measure to see if they're going to be a good homeowner. We've got a, like a 96, 97 percent success rate in our families staying in their house and paying off the mortgages. Well, so, and, and that goes that goes right back to that theory of you know give you a fish and you can eat today, but teach you how to fish right. and you live That's for a exactly. lifetime. Cause you're right. Somebody, Hey, here's a free house or, you know, low cost house. Mm-hmm. And, and if you don't reeducate the bad habits to get somebody in the first place in that right. situation, history is bound to repeat itself. And it does. And it does. A, a couple of years later, they're right back into that, that same cycle with missed payments mm-hmm. and, and who knows whatever else, you know, you know, and things happen along the way with families. Um, if they, if they get in trouble, we offer counseling, we offer a, a modification to the loan. We offer one time refi to keep them in their house. So, right. You know, with over close to 270 homes and 11 foreclosures, five of which were before 1995, when we had the programs in place, um, we really work hard with them. So if, if there is a foreclosure, they just kind of walked away. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe they couldn't catch up or didn't care anymore. And who knows? Things sure. happen. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's, it's across, I think, any any walk of life, any social, economical mm-hmm situation. We talk all the time about, you know, we talk at, um, you know, folks who are the old one paycheck away or right. have empty cabinets. You may live in the, the, you know, bushy of, 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 um, of HOAs, you know, the creme de la creme, yep. but you're just hanging on to that lifestyle and you open the cabinets up and you've got crickets in there. That's right. And you know, that's a very real thing. It's not just in mm-hmm. my estimation, it's not just folks who are on that bottom of the, the food chain, so to speak, it can go all the way to the top and it, it doesn't matter. Right. And, and what, what we do when we sell a house to a family, uh, we get the house appraised and let's say it appraised at a hundred thousand dollars. We don't charge more than one third of their monthly income for the mortgage payment. So let's say their mortgage payment reflects they could only afford a seventy thousand dollar home. Well, mm-hmm. we sell it for seventy thousand, then we put a ghost mortgage on up to their appraised value, and that's there for a couple reasons. It's it stops predatory lenders from coming in and say, "Wow, you got thirty thousand dollars equity in this house. I could loan you this. Right? Uh, you could, you know, you can get a car, or whatever you want." And then it protects us from them flipping the house and trying to walk away with the funding. If they do sell the house, the second mortgage is activated, so there is no financial gain for them. Sure. So it sure. protects everybody. So let's let's look at two in two different ways I want to go. We're talking with Roy Kramer from Habitat for Humanity here in the Midlands. Habitat, of course, a international organization, a very big presence in South Carolina. Uh, wherever you're listening to this morning here in the Palmetto State, there's a there's a Habitat group. I'm sure pretty close uh, hmm. to where you are. So yeah, let, let's let's talk about the, the two different things. So, I want I want to talk about some of the family profiles and that process. And mm-hmm. then the process of the house. So let's let's start with the families because okay. you know, or the individual. It, right. it can be it can be just an individual, right? Yes, it can. Okay. Yes, it can. So so here I am. I'm like you know I I, I need some help. I need a place to live. I'm going to call Roy at Habitat for Humanity. Right. Walk me through that process. Okay. Uh, they can call in at any time. Their name will go on a list because our application meetings are held in January. Okay. So we'll get back to everybody as it as it approaches to lock down the times and the dates. Um, but typically what happens, I think last year we had close to a thousand people that had called in. Um, we only had three people, excuse me, 300 people who showed up and it's over a, a two to three night period based on how many folks are there. It's a, it's an Ebenezer Lutheran church downtown on Sumter street. And it starts at six thirty, and you gotta be there. You gotta be in cause they lock the door at six thirty. Mm-hmm. And and the application meeting takes them through all the things they're going to have to go through to get in the program. So when they leave, they get an application now, out of the, let's say, 100 people showed up that first night, half of them will either get up and leave in the middle or never come back. We won't hear from them again. Is it just because, hey, it's too much, too much darn work? Well, it's it's, it's it, more than I thought it was? It's I've not seen free. them get up and walk out because they find out it's not free and they got to work for it. Right. So they're gone. Out of the, let's say, 50 of them leave with an application, we'll get half of those back. Mm-hmm. People will lose interest or get struggle, you know, struggling with it. Uh, we're a phone call away. So out of the ones that come back in, that's when the volunteer um, committees go to work, you know, doing the home visits and doing the financial background checks. We don't do anything as a staff. We facilitate all that, but we don't do any selection. So then they finally vote on a certain amount that uh, we feel we can service in the next two years. 
then they approve them. It goes to the board for final approval. So it's a lengthy process, but it all actually all happens in about 90 days from the time they turn it in. Right. And how, how, say how many people then in that selection process a year, I mean, how many, how many houses simultaneously right now, either, either in the Midlands area or South Carolina area, are, are you simultaneously building, servicing these people? I, I think we service across the state close to a hundred houses a year wow. with all the affiliates. Now we're doing seven to eight. It'll fluctuate. Um, we got to get way out in front of that to secure property and, and get sure. things all clear. That's, that's probably our biggest uh, problem is you can find property, but the acquisition is, is tough because there could be a no will and, and the heirs, you can't find them or, or right. there's liens on the property. So, and you want to try to keep everybody in the same area. So, you know, we're, we're working in KC and things are working out good. Sure. I think we've been in there three years now and I can't remember how many houses we have, but I think we're right around 10 right now. Oh. And, and we're trying to be a year and a half ahead of construction. Mm-hmm. So, if they're coming through the program, they can volunteer at the restore. They can volunteer at the office. They can volunteer on the job site. They got to maintain 20 hours a month. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but if you've got three children and Saturday's your only day off, you've got to figure out what to do with the kids. Right. And, you know, you can get your five hours in every Saturday and you can maintain your 20 hours a month. Uh, some folks, you know, um, may be handicapped in some fashion where they can't be out on the build site. Well, they, they come into the office and they answer the phones. We've had almost every kind of scenario. We've had blind people. We've had uh, people that have a disability and they maneuvering. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter. We work with them however we can. It's great to have somebody answering the phones. You know? right. And they become family for us because you're around them for two years and then you're around them as you're building in a neighborhood sure. watching the kids grow. I've been there long enough to see kids come in and paying mom and dad's uh, mortgage payment and they're grown. No kidding. Yeah. Wow. That's got to give you a pretty good feeling too though, right? It, as, it as a, is. As a it volunteer, is. as an employee, whatever your affiliation may be with Habitat. It is. For, especially for you, Roy, you've been f- since 94. So a 20, my math is so terrible, 24 years. 26. I you I'm know. in my 26 year. There you go. Um, but, you know, to be in that spot where you, you know, remember when sure. little Tommy, you know, was four years old and, yep. and he got yep. his first room and, and now he's stopping by with yep. mom and dad. I and mean, that's got to be pretty cool. Like, wow. It I mean, is. It makes it a is. difference, right? I run into him around town every once in a while. I hear somebody yell out my name and I'll turn around. You don't remember me. Well, you were five years old, you know. Right. <laughs> You're when, now as voting. T- as soon as they tell me my na- <laughs> their name, I know exactly who they are. Sure. Yeah. And our board, uh, we're a Chodo board, a community housing development organization. So one third of our board are low income individuals. We have 18 board members, so six of them have to be low income. Well, they're all our homeowners, and most of them have paid off their house. So mm-hmm. I've got people on the board where rubber meets the road, and it really makes for an interesting board. Wow. Yeah. So when you're looking at a, a potential house then, or, you know, you've, you, you're going to buy one, are you, are you looking at lots, old houses, anything in the middle, and, and you, I assume you purchase it, or are you looking for right. the homeowners to donate that home to, or, uh, or both? A couple ways we go about it. Uh, for, for, for our first 30 years, all we did was build houses for our families. So our acquisition was empty land. Mm-hmm. And we, we were building our own subdivisions, basically. We've got one with 47 houses, one oh, with wow. 60, one with 18, one with nine. And then when the economy went south, um, at the same time, we were negotiating phase two of a certain part of our property. And uh, we were considered developers now because we were getting large enough. Well, to be a developer, you got to get the roads in, the water in, the sewer in, all that stuff in first. There's there's a lot to and, that. And nobody gives us money for that. So right. um, we went back into infill builds, and then Habitat International came along with a, a new program, Neighborhood Revitalization Initiative. We jumped on that. So we're going back into marginal neighborhoods, declining neighborhoods, and we're buying up the empty lots and the boarded up houses. If we can refurbish the house, we do for our family. If not, it comes down. So we're using grant money to acquire the properties, or sometimes we buy it outright um, just so we don't lose it. And then what we do is we go in and we'll build for our families. But the beautiful part about what we're doing now is we go door to door on that block and see whoever owns their home qualifies for repair programs. So if you're a veteran, we can do repairs inside and outside the home. If you have a mobility issue, the program's called Aging in Place. We can do repairs inside and out. And what that usually is, is a handicap ramp on the outside. Now, these homes are old, and and all the bathroom doors 15 years ago were two feet wide, 24 inches wide. And that's that's a problem for senior citizens because they can't negotiate. And they got a walkers walker. and they've got yeah all kinds yeah. of stuff. Sure. And we can't widen the door because the switch is usually there and the sink's there. So we're looking at the idea of putting a barn door, which you could at least slide, mm-hmm. and the grab bar's right there. Sure. So if we can do that in some places, Chip we'll and Joanna that. would love you for that. Yeah. Barn door is the rage, yes. Roy. I'm telling they're, they're, you, they're in all our houses now. That's that's the bathroom door for the master bedroom now. Right. They love them. So we do repairs for them, and the third program is called a brush with kindness. It's only external repairs. Um, 
somebody could have uh, a yard that needs to be cleaned up, a, a couple shingles missing on the roof, rotten wood, cracked window. We come in with volunteer groups and we'll clean up the yard, sand, uh, ch um, chip the house down, mm -hmm. clean the walls off. I'm sorry, I'm looking for the word for that. Mm -hmm. Scrape the house down, repaint it. And um, it makes a huge difference because when we're finishing up our builds and you've got houses up and down the street where we, we can go do repairs and stuff, it changes the whole complexion of the neighborhood. Right. And it really brings back hope for the folks that are there because 90% of them are senior citizens and there's no one there to help them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a story. We, we, we did a house over near Columbia College. Two doors down was a 90-year-old lady, and she was on kidney dialysis twice a week. So she'd go out her door, and her step down was 18 inches. She'd have to hold the column and slide down and then walk across the grass to a waiting car. We met with her, and we ended up building a 5x5 five five treated deck on the back of the house, and we poured a concrete um, ramp all the way to where the car would be, 35 feet, okay. and uh, scraped the house down, repainted it, and rescreened the porch. And her cost was $67. I mean, it's on a sliding scale based on what you can afford. Wow. Now, the, the, the hard part for the, I mean, the hard part for us, and the sad part is we can't go everywhere and do this. It's only in the neighborhoods where we're working because sure. there's only, we only have a staff of 10. So we're getting traction on this, and once we get it going, we've identified six neighborhoods within Richland, Lexington County. We've got 10 years of work in front of us. It could go on forever. I'll, I'll hand it off to somebody one of these days. Right. Yeah. I don't see that happening anytime soon. Right? You used to look full of uh, full of vinegar, yeah, I'm enjoying as they it. Still. No, I'm, I'm still enjoying it. Yeah. But you know, and I and I like the concept too of when you go into a neighborhood and start buying the the distressed, the dilapidated properties because you're also helping increase the home values of the ones, even if it's an empty lot right, right. now, right. it's not deteriorating. Or if right. you have an old beat up house, you knock it down. You now at least have an empty lot, which is anytime going to be better when you're looking at a home value to bring new people in and revitalize a, a neighborhood or an HOA or, or, or whatever, right? It's it's getting great traction with the volunteers, too. They like the idea because you can picture on a Saturday on a street, we're building a house over here. We're repairing this one down here. We're cleaning up the yard down here. It's all ages that can come out. Sure. And it's it, especially on repairs and stuff, you see instant gratification. You go in there and clean up the yard. You can see it at the end of the day. There's a huge trash pile out there. We spent Saturday cleaning out... Um, where the community garden's going to go, or already is, we're cleaning out another area because we're going to build more um, raised beds. And we brought everything to the curb late Saturday. It was a huge trash pile. I went by it this morning. The trash pile's gone already. So it's like, thank you. <laughs> Casey's right on top of it. It just it's, yeah. Casey's a great little town. But yes, I tell you, yes. at least Parton has got things locked down in her yes. little town. There's no, <laughs> there is no they are great to work with. Yeah. Do do you ever get pushback from from communities? Maybe hopefully not here in South Carolina, but I'm, I'm sure there's. There's got to be some pushback that you get when you go into a neighborhood, either people are protective, not wanting you in there, or right. maybe even from the cities for whatever reasons, right? Well, I wouldn't know it if it was from the city, but had, we've run into it in, in the county with the neighborhoods we've gone into mm -hmm. years back when we were just building houses. It's called NIMBY, not in my backyard. Right. Uh, they don't want you there. You're going to bring the property value down. Once we can meet with the local folks there and educate them on what we're doing, then they understand that we're not going to bring their values down. We're not going to go into a high-end neighborhood and, and try to plug in this house. I mean, we couldn't afford the lot to begin with. Sure. Um, but I've only seen it happen twice. Well, that's good. At least the human spirit is in it, understanding yes. what you're doing. So when you when you you look at a property, you know, I guess you know you say is your is there an aggregate number you're always looking like you want to buy about hundred thousand bucks? Is that is there like a number or do you? I understand that yeah. you know your your profile is going to be of of the end user, but where do you how do you, when you're looking through the the for sale, right. you know, the MLS and the for sale lots. How do you kind of decide your search criteria? We actually don't even do that. We What we do is we go through a neighborhood and ride around and look at the empty lots and the boarded up houses, get those addresses, go look at the appraised values, and that's what we offer. Okay. It's, it's a pretty simple process. Sure. Um, you know, they're they're generally 50 years old and, mm -hmm. and no one's going to fix it up. That's going to have to come down. Um, so the only thing I've seen happen is once we got into a neighborhood – uh, one of the neighborhood folks was trying to run around and buy the properties ahead of us mm -hmm. and then try to sell them at a higher rate, but <laughs> it doesn't work with us. <laughs> yes. Capitalism at its finest, <laughs> right? Good gosh. And then, and then when you marry, I suppose then you've got the house built and you kind of know what it, what should appraise at. Obviously going into that, when you identify your, your family or your recipient, if it's a single guy or girl or whatever, uh, you've obviously married that property with, okay, this is what you realistically can afford. So if you buy the house and you've got a 150 in it, but they just don't have the job to support it or whatever, that's not your house, right? So you now have got a, the selection process is marrying, okay, you can afford 150 with some education and right. some help. Right. 
right? Well, the way it works is is most of our folks are at low income and we know what their income is already mm -hmm. and we know what their monthly payment can be. So if we go beyond it, we know we can put them in this more expensive home if that's what it appraises at because we're still going to sell it to them on what we know they can afford and we'll put a ghost mortgage on the second half. Right. I've had some where they could afford a $90,000 home. I had one lady in the office one day and we had determined what her monthly uh, mortgage payment was. It was $500 a month. And she had come into the office and stepped in the, stepped in the finance office and he said, oh, I've got your payment for you. It's 500. And she went, excuse me? I mean, she was paying like 900 renting. Right. So we're well below, they all gonna get their house for lower than what rent they're paying right. currently. Now, when you when you talk about the ghost mortgage, for folks who don't understand the the lending, you can have two mortgages, and a lot of times you'll when you buy a house just regular on the market, you'll you'll actually be a second mortgage butted up to, mm -hmm. it, and that's just the way it works. Right. Um, what happens to that? Say it's a seventy thousand is what I pay for my house that you and your team have built me, and you've got that thirty k ghost mortgage. Once I pay off that first seventy, what happens to that ghost mortgage? Well, it, it it's uh, it comes down every time you make a payment. It's it comes down. So they meet at the end of your payment. Okay. So if, if the ghost mortgage is for 30 and the main mortgage is for 20 years, you figure what that amount is for 30 years for that, excuse me, for the time for the 30,000. So right. it might be 300. So you're forgiving 300 every month. So when they make their last payment, that one meets it right, right. at the same time. So they own it. And, and, they're, and they're buying these houses. And as you said, you know, that ghost mortgage is there to protect somebody coming in and, you know, flipping and all the right. nefarious things that can happen. Right. But at the end of the day, once you sign the paperwork and I sign that mortgage, that seventy thousand on, you know, with a thirty ghost, uh, that's still it's my house, right? It's, you guys, it. you, you pretty it. much step step no, away. They, and, they own and, it. They own it. Now, do you use regular lenders, or does it lend through Habitat, or how, who are the other people involved? We used to carry the mortgages ourselves, and um, in twenty fourteen, the the government decided that Habitat for Humanity is a bank because mm -hmm. we hold mortgages. So now we fell under all the banking regs. We don't have the capacity to handle that. So we outsourced our mortgage collections and that's where we're with state housing. Now they handle all that. Mm -hmm. um, they just call us when someone's behind and say, what do you want to do? You know, bring them in for counseling or whatever. Right. But that, that relieves us from all of that. What do you do and where do you, I mean, you've already alluded to some grants and things like that. So whether again, it's, it's the Midlands uh, branch, it's the South Carolina branch or it's the U S branch, where are you getting your initial, well, your operations, obviously you're selling houses, but I mean, there's still got to be a little bit of a uh, wiggle room in there is a loss and that loss where does that funding come in from well it's it's not a loss um all the materials are paid for we we find sponsors to build the house um we also have a restore and and their revenue helps pay off you know wherever we might be short but we we collect almost the exact amount that it takes to build that house from our sponsors oh wow okay yeah all right. And they, and they do that just because obviously it's a write off for them as a five, one, they want to be involved, yeah. but they, you know, yeah. they want to be involved. They want to be a part of yep. the revitalization, the giving back of freedom, the giving back of, of a sense of home. Right. Right. And we've had essentially the same sponsors since I've been there, but we do pick up new ones every now and then. Sure. So, you know, it's a learning curve for them. They don't know anything about what we're doing. Um, and once they go through one build, they're hooked. Right. It's a great employee, um, you know, I don't know what you call it. Uh, it's a great sponsor connection, right? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a team building thing sure. for them because when they come out, the level, the playing field is level. It doesn't matter if you're the CEO or the janitor. We're all doing the same thing that day. Mm -hmm. And and you really get a kick out of watching them laughing at each other. Right. You know, you might have the CEO, he's on a ladder and he can't, he's scared the second step up or she's scared <laughs> and people don't realize, you know, they're different in the office, but out here, it doesn't matter what we're doing. Speaking with Roy Kramer, the executive director of uh, Habitat for Humanity here in the Midlands. And again, there's a presence of Habitat all across the state of South Carolina, the, the country and internationally, 70 different countries. And so that leads me to my next question then. Volunteer opportunities. You have a staff of 10. Mm -hmm. There's not 10 people who are simultaneously building all these houses. You're, no. you're relying on, on the volunteers, the yes. folks in the program having yes. to give their time. Yes. But I, how do you teach somebody maybe who wants to, who, whose heart is bigger than their technical know-how. <laughs> we, we, all, we all know geniuses it's, are book smart that may not know the business end of a hammer. Yeah, no, it's very, very simple. Um, you, you, I'd rather have people who've never swung a hammer come out and work on a house because, you know, in five minutes you can teach somebody how to hit a nail. They may not hit it every time, but they'll get it after a while. Right. Uh, we have crew chiefs on the site that, that work with everybody. Uh, we have a house broken down to hour by hour, what it takes to do it, how many people for each task. It's very, very simple. Um, 
we are nails are in color coded buckets, so we're not talking about this is a sixteen penny nail. Grab that. You know they don't sure. they don't know those terms. Just grab the nails out of the red bucket, put them in your apron. When you're done, put them back in the red bucket. These are things we learned along the way. You know, once all the buckets were the same color, well, people would just dump their nails in there. You right know, now, you got a mess. But we've we've learned how to to work it where it's very we make it fun for the folks. It's right. very very simple. And so like on an average Saturday, then you know, kind of paint a paint a visual. You've mm-hmm. got you've got perhaps the homeowners, the recipients to be are out there helping with right. the family, right? And then you've got a, a cadre, I guess, of of volunteers, right? Yeah, it could be it could be a corporation. We take fifty uh, per house, fifteen volunteers in the morning, fifteen in the afternoon. Mm-hmm. That's that's the manageable number that you can work with. And then there's tasks involved where you're taking three over here, five over there, and, and everybody, we know what we're doing. So I may have somebody over here sorting through wood. I may have somebody over here raking the yard, somebody over there um, starting to load things up onto the floor, you know, and, and you know. So, so these aren't like, if you're not an electrician, you don't have to worry about if you don't have any skill. Like, right. obviously you have G general contractors do the the stuff they have to to be up to code. Right? Yeah, yes, yes. You do not want me wiring anything. Right. right. No, no, no. We, we have subcontractors. In fact, all our subcontractors have been with us for over 20 years. Great. And, uh, same guys. They're, they're mostly, um, individuals, you know, they have their mm-hmm. own company. Um, so they, they come in when the volunteers are not there. Right. Okay. To do their thing. And do and their we thing. We come in behind them. You know, I'll, I'll tell the electrician, you don't have to clean up or the plumber, you don't have to clean up. No. Wow. Cause we come in and we clean up. We do that job for sure. Tell me about the uh, the Ride with Roy um, okay. program. Okay. Um, the Ride with Roy came about, I guess, maybe six or eight months ago. Right. And and the idea behind it is to Go take ahead. to take people on a ride um, through the neighborhood where we built. Right. Where we're what we're doing right now. What's already been done and what's ahead. And what they see is they'll pull up in front of a house and and I have a, a little fold out for them and they'll see a picture of what was there. Mm-hmm. And then, okay, that was right there. And they look, oh, oh my gosh, you know, now there's a brand new house there. Or we'll go down the street and you see a, they'll look at a picture where mm-hmm. um, there was an old rotten ramp and now this is what's here. Then they see a piece of land that has a dilapidated building or in one case, just a chimney sitting there and now there's a house sure. there. So they get the full feel of everything we're doing on a, a particular neighborhood. And they it, call that the big reveal in the TV business. Is that right? Boy, it's, I it's, mean, it's they, the big reveal. Ask yeah. Chip and Joanna. They know it. They're good at it. So we do that and we explain <laughs> everything we're doing. Then we take them back to our office. And the last thing I show them is our wood shop, which we're setting up for youth development. Mm-hmm. And, and when you come in there, you'll see all the things we can make. Birdhouses, butterfly houses, cutting boards, toolboxes, all kinds of things that youth can do. So we're going to be launching that hopefully in December. And the idea behind it is in our we don't have down months, but in the cold months, we don't have a lot of volunteers. So from December through the end of February, you're not going to get very many people out there. We're usually winding down for Christmas and getting ready to start. And then the hot summer months from June to end of August, it's tough to get volunteers out there. Well, it's might, 195 degrees, yeah, Roy. Yeah. Well, sometimes we go all the way through, but you know they're gone by 11 o'clock in the morning, and, right. and it's understandable. That's when we're going to open up the youth development to bring people in there, and they can do different things uh, it's already now mushroomed into the idea of a wine and cheese night where adults can come in and make cutting boards and have their wine and cheese. We've had birthday parties in there for kids. So it's um, the idea behind it is we're going to challenge seventh grade to 12th grade to come in. Mm-hmm. And we're not sure how we're going to set it up, but they're going to have a, a, a we're going to have a sink set up that's leaking. We're going to have a toilet that leaks. We're going to have uh, they're going to have to fix both, figure out right. what to do. And there'll be simple leaks, but you know, most people will either walk away from it because they don't know how to do it, or they'll call somebody and spend a lot of money to have them come out for nothing. Or they could problem solve, like exactly. teaching these these guys, exactly. these young guys and girls to, to do right. it themselves. They're going to have to hang a mini blind. They're going to have to take a doorknob and a deadbolt off and put a new right. one in its place. And they're going to have to patch a hole in a sheetrock wall. When they do those, they will get their own little toolbox. And the idea for them is, I've had so many kids out there that have never held a hammer, right. you know, never read a tape measure, don't know how to do any of this. All the basics. Well, they'll earn their tools. And adults, too. There is so much more to Habitat for Humanity than I would ever have guessed, mm-hmm. and there's a lot more we could talk about. We're out of time today. Uh, real quick, Habitat for Humanity SC, is that the direct line to you? CSC. CSC. We'll put a link for you at the uh, Carolina Cares tab, WVOC.com for you guys. Uh, Roy, thank you so much for sure. what you're doing thank for, you. for the neighborhoods. Everything is so much to do with Habitat for Humanity. Very, very interesting half hour. My name is Tyler Ryan here on Carolina Cares, an iHeart Media production from our flagship station in Columbia. Columbia, South Carolina. If you have an idea for a show or like to appear, you can email me, Tyler Ryan at 
iHeartMedia.com. Once again, this has been Carolina Cares, an iHeartMedia production. Thank you so much for joining us today, and I'll speak with you in seven days.